afternoon. I'm here to talk about human potential. Potential. It's just a word that brims with possibility, doesn't it? It alludes to what can become, the hope of what might be achieved or harnessed or cultivated. We all have potential, but do we know how to get there? I think the point of our journey as humans is to become, to achieve our potential and become our best selves. In fact, we're wired to do so. We're guided by an emotional compass, and when we're on path to our potential, we feel excited, motivated, engaged. And we get off that path, we feel bored, anxious, even depressed. Passion is part of this, too. When people are doing things they're passionate about, their face lights up. You can see it. Turns out their brains light up, too. On MRIs, you can see the reward part of the brain lighting up when people do something that they're passionate about. So if all this wiring is helping us achieve our potential, why doesn't everyone get there? Well, it's because we're also wired in ways that get in the way of our potential. This is different than our success. I've done a lot of research and writing on success. People can be successful and not achieving their potential. I'm a leadership coach and consultant. I'm in the business of helping people and organizations achieve their highest potential. And over the years, I've worked with thousands of people, and I've seen this pattern emerge. It didn't matter if I worked with a business, a government agency, a school, or a nonprofit. It didn't matter if I was working with engineers, or doctors, nurses, teachers, lawyers. It transected every part of diversity, age, gender, race, ethnicity. And what I saw was two consistent things getting in the way of people's potential and both have to do with how we're wired. The first is the amygdala hijack. This is when the primitive part of our brain takes over and makes us do dumb things. We've all seen it. That customer who's just way upset over something really small, or that coach who loses it and shoves the athlete, or your friend who's normally outgoing all of a sudden shutting down and clamming up. We've all had it happen to us too. I was that overly upright Customer, renting a car of all things, he just wouldn't listen to me. He kept trying to upsell me, upsell me on things I didn't need. I've also been that uber defensive employee who's arguing with her boss during her performance review. When it's happening, I almost can't help myself. I feel intense emotions inside, like fear or anger. My stomach knots up, my heart starts to race, and I also get very righteous. You're going to listen to me, damn it. <laughs> Amygdala hijack is a mouthful. This is how I remember it. Ah! <laughs> but here's what's really going on. What's happening is we're being driven by our need to survive, our wiring to survive. The fight or flight response has been tripped off. Now, fight or flight is a wonderful thing. It's designed to power up our bodies and help us survive the threat. And let's say I was driving my car and I was losing control. I would want my heart to start beating faster, pushing blood to my muscles so I can respond quicker. I would appreciate that my bronchial tubes are opening so my lungs can fill with oxygen. And I'd be grateful that my higher thinking brain is going offline, because I don't really need my logical analysis at the moment. It also takes away my self-awareness, which is awesome, because if I do in fact crash, I don't want to be laying there fully aware of the extent of my injuries. But renting a car is not a life-threatening situation, and neither is a performance review. So what's going on? Well, over time, our brain builds a database of things it perceives as threatening. These are certainly things that are physically threatening. So for example, my friend, she was attacked by a dog. And even though she's a dog lover, she couldn't stop her amygdala from firing off every time she saw a dog. Now over time, her brain relearned that dogs can be OK, but it still happens if she sees a dog that's aggressive or looks like the one that attacked her. It also gets tripped off for things that are emotionally threatening. Let's say Uncle Bob was mean to you when you were a kid. What if your boss sounds like Uncle Bob? Your amygdala could be firing off every day at work. 
And it's probably not great if your logic and self-awareness is going offline every time your boss comes around. This is what was happening for me. When I was sitting in that performance review, I was triggered. When I was a kid, my mom would fly into a rage every time I messed up, and I'd get screamed at and I'd get punished. So as I'm sitting there and she's going over my areas for improvement, I have all this in, inner turmoil going on. My heart starts to race, I start to feel anxious, and even though she's wonderful and calm, I'm waiting to get hit. All this stuff is firing off in my body, and even though I try to contain it, it's coming out at her. I'm arguing, I'm getting defensive, not exactly professional behavior. It wasn't just at work, either. If a friend ever left a message on my machine saying, we need to talk, I'd be a hot mess for days until I could get a hold of them and fix whatever I had done wrong. Over time, I realized I had a pattern. This kept happening if I was in a situation where I felt like I was messing up. And my amygdala hijack turned into my own personal aha moment. And I'm not the only one. In my line of work, I see this all the time. Triggers and hijacks are at the heart of most situations that I've been called in to consult about. Poor judgment, unprofessional behavior, interpersonal conflict. People do stuff they wouldn't normally do when they're hijacked, like become rude, or tell a lie, or manipulate the situation, which makes sense. Their logic and their self-awareness is gone, right? I think the amygdala hijack is the most important thing we need to know about how we're wired as humans because you're gonna to have to deal with it regularly, your own hijacks, and you're also gonna be on the receiving end of other people's. Here's what I know. A lot of people have suffered significant trauma in their lives. Let me share some statistics with you. These are just for the United States. Two million people a year report being victims of violent crime. One in four women will be sexually assaulted or molested in her lifetime. One in six men will be sexually molested, usually as a child. Six million children are abused every year. One in 10 people is addicted to alcohol, drugs, or both. And 20% of adults in the United States, roughly 45 million, experience a mental illness, ranging from anxiety and depression to schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Now imagine these statistics if we expanded to the rest of the world and included countries that are dealing with civil war, political unrest, genocide. Now there are some overlaps between them. My mom's mental health contributed to the abuse I experienced as a child. And she herself suffered severe trauma in her childhood, which shaped her mental well-being. These people like, used to be like I used to be, unaware of their hijacks and unable to control them. And then there's people who know what hijacks are and learn how to manage them. I'm now part of this group. We know what's likely to trigger us. We recognize the symptoms in our bodies. We're all a little bit different. Mine looks different than yours. And we know what to do when it happens. Most important thing to do, buy yourself some time. Your primitive brain is in charge and it's very persuasive. It's gonna say, let's yell at this guy. He totally deserves it. I did apologize to the car rental guy. You're not fit to interact with other people when you're in that state. Do not pick up the phone, do not send the email, even though you're dying to. The other thing is you gotta know how to get yourself out of a hijack once you're in one. Here are some of my favorites. Breathe. Breathing in and out to the count of four a few times actually calms the parasympathetic system. Let's try this. That was actually for me, I really needed that right now. <laughs> move, move around, get in your body. That disperses the adrenaline and you'll feel more grounded. Write, if you're in the middle of a staff meeting, it's okay, grab a sheet of paper. I'm totally angry right now, I got a knot in my stomach. Just using words brings your higher brain back online. If you feel safe enough, talk about it. I'm triggered right now, I need a few minutes. And if you can't control yourself, Leave. Get out of the situation before you do damage. Pretend that you have an important call to make, need to use the restroom, doesn't matter. Just get out of there before your lizard brain makes a mess. Now, what does this have to do with potential? Everything. 
When I was walking around in fear that I was going to upset people, I wasn't stepping into my potential. I was limiting my own growth. And until I learned how to control my hijacks, I wasn't really fit for a leadership role either. What if I got triggered by an employee? What if I lost it with a client? I could have done some damage. Now, don't get me wrong. There's lots of people in leadership positions who don't manage their hijacks. I'm sure we've all worked with one at some point in our lifetime. I think the most dangerous thing is a person with power who doesn't know how to manage their hijacks. The news, the headlines are filled with all these stories. CEOs, political leaders, movie stars, and even people in uniform who've been hijacked. If we're lucky, they just do something rude but harmless. But hijacks are also connected to aggression, criminal behavior, and even extreme violence. Now, there's a second pattern that I saw that consistently got in the way of people's ability to step into their potential. We are wired to belong. We are connection-seeking creatures. Now, wait, what? How could that possibly be a bad thing? Well, let me tell you. We hunger to belong. We yearn for it. We know that being connected to other people brings us all kinds of things, love, connection, safety. All the research on happiness shows that even having a couple friends makes all the difference. And healthy babies, if they're not held and touched when they're little, they wither and die. We all have wounds around belonging. Our childhoods were filled with times of rejection and exclusion, and this can be playing out in your adult life. In my work, I see this all the time. Let me tell you about John. John came to me for coaching. He'd been put on a performance improvement plan in his company because he had a hard time getting along with his peers. He was overbearing, jumping into their conversations uninvited, telling them what to do. In staff meetings, he was the know-it-all or the show-off. Have you ever worked with a John? I think we all have. Here's the thing. John's behavior is all about belonging. When someone's trying that hard to be seen, it's because they don't feel seen. It's because they've never felt seen. I asked John what he was trying to accomplish, and he said, I just want people to see that I'm smart and have something to contribute. And so I asked him, when was the first time you felt that way? And it immediately came to him. Second grade. I was the new kid at a new, at a new school. It was his first day, and the principal was walking him into the classroom. And the door was at the front of the room, so that when they walked in, all of his classmates were looking up at him. I'm sure you can picture that. And the teacher said, welcome. We're having a spelling bee. Since you're up here, why don't you go first? <laughs> yeah, wow. John said he'll never forget that moment. He didn't even get to put his stuff down. The word was soldier, and he misspelled it. Everybody laughed. And later at recess, they called him dumb. And he said, I spent the rest of my time at that school trying to prove that I was smart. And then he looked at me and he said, I guess I've never stopped. I've never stopped. He realized that these group situations at work were triggering off his stuff about not being seen. That his inner second grader was popping up and kind of taking over, making him behave like an eight-year-old. It's a little bit like the amygdala hijack, but instead of about surviving, it's about belonging. Now, some of us are still working out our belonging things from our childhood peers. Like Maria, when she was younger, her best friend told her her feelings were silly. So as an adult, she puts everybody else's feelings first. Everybody else's needs and wants take, take priority, even when it's to her detriment. Or Michael, who spent his awkward teenage years disappearing into books and computer games because that's what he could control. And as an adult, he disappears into them when he needs to belong. Some of us are still working out stuff about belonging in our own families. I worked with a lawyer who built her entire practice around representing drug addicts because she's still trying to understand why her own mother chose drugs over the kids. Or the pediatric emergency room nurse who's trying to show her dad that she can be perfect by choosing the most demanding form of nursing possible, even though her heart's not in it. Or the CEO who knowingly violates environmental laws that he's, because he's not going to let anyone tell him what to do ever again. Now, it's fairly easy to manage our belonging triggers. John just needed to learn to recognize when his inner second grader was showing up and give himself something to do instead of his usual behavior. 
He writes his good ideas down on a sheet of paper and saves them till an appropriate time. Maria gives herself a few hours between when a request comes from friend or family so that she can think about how she's feeling and talk herself through her need to please everyone. Now, this sounds a little bit like a little bit of work, and it is at first, but it gets easier with time. Here's some good news about our wiring. Our brains are wired to form habits. And if you do something about 40 repetitions, it actually forms the neural pathway that gets thicker the more you do it. So if you commit to a change, it gets easier. Here's the thing I want you to know. Surviving and belonging is about our past. And our potential is about our future. Once we can manage our past, we can really focus on becoming who we're meant to be. None of us are broken. I'm not broken. You're not broken. But we do need to be able to handle our wiring. It's part of who we are. And it actually serves a meaningful purpose. But we need some tools to manage it. And I would say not only for ourselves, but we need those tools to help other people. Because you know that other guy? That guy that drives you crazy, the guy that's not very nice to you? He's not broken either. Here's some things we can all do. Let's talk about our stuff. It's OK to say, I've got a trigger around messing up, or I am not my best self right now. Come back later. Let's have compassion when people are in their stuff. We've all been there. And the last thing you need when you're triggered is to feel judged, too. Let's teach this stuff. Look at what we did in 15 minutes. I think this should be part of parenting classes, teaching programs, and management training. Let's make coaching and therapy accessible and affordable to everyone so that people can heal their past and step into their future. And let's role model what it looks like to take responsibility for harnessing your own potential and become your best self. When I was on my journey, I had a quote that really got me through, and I want to leave you with it. It's from Carl Jung. I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Thank you.